Using the MVH time domain feature, that's going to enable us to locate the source of those intermittent knocking noises, the one-off events that happen instantaneously. They generate a lot of noise, a real nuisance, a real true complaint from customers. How can we use time domain NVH to locate the source of intermittent knocking, creaking, squeaking noises? I'm quite comfortable with amplitude and frequency. I understand that concept. And I'm very interested in this because throughout my career, we've had any number of noises, exactly what you've described as a one-off event that's almost impossible to nail. What exactly is the difference with time domain? Okay, so where is the offending noise coming from? That's really how we want to use the software to our advantage. MVH time domain, you can see here that we have four accelerometers connected to one picoscope. We've chosen the vertical axis from each accelerometer and channel A here is recording the highest amplitude. What we can't do with NVH time domain is measure time because we know that amplitude can trip us over depending on how we've located the accelerometer and the mass that the accelerometer is attached to. But if we were to use picoscope time domain, then we can measure time. We can zoom in and we can find out which accelerometer was the first responder. The first responder will be the closest to the source of the knocking noise. And we'll demonstrate this a little bit later on. So from my understanding, what you've just said is that in time domain, what we're looking for is the, the, the first event that responds with the noise. The first accelerometer. The that first responds. accelerometer Absolutely, that yeah. responds to the event. Yes. And we're looking at that with the scope yes. in an infin infinitely variable time base. Yeah. I think we'll run the demonstration in NVH. So you can see time domain function with NVH. It will detect the knocking noise. We'll see amplitude. We'll be able to determine one or perhaps two accelerometers that are closest to the source of the noise, but we can confirm this categorically using Picoscope to measure the first responding accelerometer. The accelerometer that responded first would be the closest to the source of the noise. So time domain, how do we apply the accelerometers? It's exactly the same as we would if we were chasing a vibration. You can see here that we have accelerometers at four key points of the suspension. So we know we have a suspension or a complaint from the driver's rear suspension, knocking noise intermittent. We've got accelerometers at track control arm, tie rods, bottom wishbone, track control arm. One of those will respond first to the knocking noise. Now, we could possibly see one accelerometer um, display a greater amplitude but that may be after the event. What is important, what's key here, is that we capture the accelerometer that responds first to the knocking noise. Let's look at this on a vehicle, how we'd actually apply these accelerometers to capture an intermittent knocking noise. The challenge we're facing here with this vehicle arises from a customer complaint of an intermittent knock. We've established that it's from the near side rear of the vehicle, and it's common with most vehicles now, we have lightweight suspension components, multi-link setup, is identifying precisely which component is responsible for this, this knock or noise. So, Steve, perhaps. Suspension knock on the left-hand rear of this vehicle. We're gonna take advantage of the NVH Advance Kit because we have four accelerometers that we can position about the suspension. It's fine that you could use the standard kit, two accelerometers, but this will be or oh, more measurements would be required. With four, we've got the advantage of pinpointing, triangulating the noise, the source of the knocking noise. So accelerometer at the moment, one mounted to the track control arm at the suspension hub, one at the lower suspension arm at the hub assembly, track control arm at the subframe, so the opposite end, each end of the track control arm, and then one at the trailing arm as well at the hub assembly. So now we'll be able to maneuver the suspension however it's necessary to generate that knock and look in the time domain of picoscope and try and determine which accelerometer is responding with the greatest amplitude. Something you actually said to me um, setting this up was the fact that you deliberately align all the accelerometers in a similar physical direction. Yeah. 
Um, as you can see, thanks, Frank. They, they, we've got accelerometers. There, um, we've rotated the magnet on the accelerometer because we can put this vertically or we can rotate it 90 degrees. And that gives us the option, certainly the angle, if we like, to measure the vertical axis because that's our chosen axis with each accelerometer. In other words, we'll compare each accelerometer mounted in the same orientation on the same axis. This is comparing apples with apples. So to make life easier here, we've color coded each one of the accelerometers just with a sticker colored dot. So if we follow these cables through, each accelerometer is connected to an interface through the interface into Picascope. And we've chosen to measure the Y axis from each accelerometer. So we're comparing the Y axis from each accelerometer in the same orientation. So the setup for the time domain measurement differs now from a road test, because remember this vehicle is on the ramp. We don't need to obtain engine speed or road speed, it's a static test. So here we'll just put a static RPM value in there. Um, we'll say that we want to measure with multiple sensors. So it's multiple sensor mode with four accelerometers. We'll say that each accelerometer is mounted in the engine compartment. Consider that as being outside of the vehicle, not inside the vehicle. It's important, of course, in each of these sections to write down exactly where your accelerometer is because we need to refer to these locations later when we're looking at the response from each accelerometer. So we go to record and analyze because there is no need to enter information like tire size. Click on the record and analyze button. And now we'll see each channel live in what we call the time domain. So any noise, any uh, knock, any input to accelerometer will be met with the response that we can measure in the time domain. So a tip here, Frank, is to just test each accelerometer before we move on. So just tap each accelerometer and check for response. Perfect. You can see then if we just quickly recap, if we pause the software and then just highlight one of those areas, yeah, there's a response from each accelerometer. You'll see how the amplitude differs depending on which accelerometer we strike. And you mentioned, Frank, about response from each of these. Yes, it was interesting that the, the transfer path can both absorb energy yeah. and amplify energy. Yes. And that, as we said, um, that the amplitude alone is not the, the definitive, definitive measurement uh, absolutely, we need to focus yeah. on. It, it's difficult to ensure that you connect every accelerometer to a surface of the same mass, same dimension. Mm -hmm. At this stage, we're looking at response. That will certainly pinpoint lead us to an area of concern. So now we've confirmed an input or a response from each accelerometer, we'll restart the software and we'll generate this knock for real. So Frank, if you can have a look there, see if you can see movement, you know identify the knocking noise. Maybe. I can see movement, that's often the case, but I'm very aware that if I go and observe the screen, there's a specific response from the red accelerometer. So let's pull that back and just drag this over. There's the movement. That's the knock that we were generating, yeah? And clearly, uh, red is responding. There's a greater amplitude from the red accelerometer. So that leads us certainly closer to the hub than further away, based on yeah, the red accelerometer, the red accelerometer location. So we can use a couple of features in the software. We can hide a few channels. The best way to do that is to right click on the software and let's take away channel A. We could also take away, um, I think, channel D. There's very little response from that accelerometer. We can clearly see there then that B, based on amplitude alone, is closest to the source. But how could we measure that more accurately? Ideally, we're looking for the first responder because that will be the closest to the source of the noise. For that, we would use Picascope because there we can measure time and we can zoom in. So our voltage settings for the accelerometer, we've gone for 100 millivolts, AC coupled. We've set the time frame to 200 millisecond divisions and we've gone for 1 million samples. That gives us a 
perfect setting to capture the response from each accelerometer. And once we've captured the response, we've got this additional feature of zooming and measure the time, looking for the first responding accelerometer, because the accelerometer that responds first is the closest to the source of the noise. A complete tip here is to make sure that you identify the positions as we did with NVH. So using the channel labels, using the notes feature, identify where each accelerometer is mounted because it could be that you've generated the noise, you're analyzing away from the vehicle. It's important that we identify accelerometer positions. I understand the, the setup for the scope, which I thank you for, Steve. Um, I, I guess that you've, you've for your input command, you're choosing a times one uh, standard correct. lead setup, yep. and that you haven't gone into the component menu. So I guess there's no accelerometer within the specific help menus with Pico software, is that correct? Uh, there isn't, you can create one. You could create a custom probe so that rather than measuring voltage, we'd be uh -huh. have a milli-G measurement. Right. But for the purpose of this test, we're just looking, remember, for the first responding accelerometer. So the voltage output from the accelerometer is fine, that's enough information right there. And I guess, depending on the amount of energy that we're, we're measuring, would, would also affect the amplitude for, for the, the setting of the, the, the scaling of the probe input. Absolutely, the point to remember, um, keep everything the same. So it's AC yes. coupled for each one, mm -hmm. the same voltage measurement, so that's we're right. on the same range. Uh, all comparisons are then equal. Yep. Let's generate this knock for real, and we'll use the features of PicoScope to zoom in and determine which was the first responding accelerometer. You captured those, Frank. Is that yeah, you've got you? to capture there. It's interesting as well that how you put effort into the into the suspension does affect the results. So maybe do multiple tests just to clarify the uh, the results. So zooming in on the test result, we can see certainly that the amplitude from the red accelerometer is greater, but more importantly that the red accelerometer was the first to deviate from zero, the first responder. So here we're relying on time to give us the indication rather than amplitude. The really interesting thing from me here, watching you do that test, although I can physically see movement in the suspension, I can't tell which joint it's coming from, whereas with MVH you can very clearly. Other uses for time domain, um, clicks, creaks, panels, um, fretting noises, they all spring to mind. Uh, Think of subframes where different sections of um, frame come together at one point, multiple weld points, um, multiple panel joints uh, where a, hinge is, a hinge panel is reinforced. So tailgate hinge, uh, door hinge, reinforcement there. Any slight movement will generate click or creak or even knock worst case scenario. Um, the base of the A-post, again, so many panels come together, the floor meets the sill, meets the A-post, meets the bulkhead. Any movement there um, as the car hits a pothole or flexes in cornering, how could you possibly pinpoint something like that? I mean, what tools have we got other than NVH? I can certainly recount at least a couple of occasions where we've had some very high-end vehicles in the workshop with exactly that phenomenon. It's a sudden noise, it's, a, it's an aggressive noise, it's a loud noise, and the, the cost, potential cost has been prohibitive. And we actually did turn the work down. So if I understand this right, I'm getting a, a feel for this now. What we're actually doing with time domain is turning sound into vision. Absolutely. So we can then understand where that noise is coming from. Yeah, we can, we can view the amplitude of the noise. Remember, we can also play this noise back because we can listen to accelerometers equally as we can microphones. That concludes Time Domain. In the next video, we'll look at the application of microphones, investigating complaints of noise.